All right, so um, we should be getting good at drawing Lewis dot structures now. And um, these are a couple that we practice, and we'll do them again for review. And we'll try to remember the steps necessary to draw good Lewis dot structures. Okay? So the first one we're going to try to draw here is carbon dioxide. We're going to try to draw carbon dioxide again. All right? So, again, just to review, um, first off, we identify the central atom. And the central atom here is the one that there's most, the fewest of. Uh, so that's one way to identify the central atom. The other way to identify the central atom is to try and choose the atom which is least electronegative. Electronegativity has to do with the periodic table. And remember, uh, electronegativity decreases, sorry, increases, electronegativity increases as we head to the right and to the top. So this is the most electronegative. So if we're looking here between carbon and oxygen for carbon dioxide, right, then the uh, least electronegative is carbon, so that's another way that we can know what the central atom is. And carbon just likes to be the central atom all the time. So, three reasons why carbon would want to be the central atom. It likes to be the central atom, it's least electronegative compared to oxygen, and there's the fewest of it. So, what I do then is I draw carbon, and then I draw the surrounding atoms, and I connect the bonds to it, okay? So that's the, 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 the first couple of things that we do. Identify the central atom, put everything else around. The next step is, and this is the most important one that people often forget, is to count how many electrons are in this party, all right? So to count how many electrons are in this party, what we do is we look how many electrons carbon brought. We can see how many electrons carbon brought by seeing that it's in the, in the looking at the representative elements. This is the fourth row, right? So we have the first and second row here, right? Third and fourth row. So carbon's in the fourth row. It brings four electrons, and each oxygen brings six because it's in the sixth row. Okay? So that's a total of six plus six, 12 plus four, uh, 16 electrons, right? Sixteen electrons. We already have one, two, three, four electrons on the board, on our molecule. And now we're going to try to distribute the rest of the electrons. So if we have four, maybe here, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Oh, there we're, we're done. So we finished, and now we look and see if everybody has the two things that they want. Uh, what are the, the two things that they're looking for when they come to this party? One, they want to have eight electrons available to them. They want to have eight electrons available to them. Two, they want to have uh, as many as they brought right around them. Okay? Okay? So, again, they want eight electrons available to them. And as many as they brought electrons, that many electrons, they want right around them. Okay? So this carbon brought four, and so it wants four electrons right around it. This oxygen brought six, and it wants seven electrons right around it. Now, you can tell how many electrons are right around it by, for example, oxygen here. You count how many electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then this bond, one of these electrons is right around this oxygen, and one is right around this carbon. So a total number of seven here are right around oxygen. So you identify the formal charge, and, and that's another way of saying this, what I've said here. As many as they brought right around them, that's also the same as saying the, uh, the, the formal charge, okay? The formal charge on an atom within a compound, okay? And you can identify that formal charge by looking at the number of electrons right around, or the number of electrons oxygen brought, for example, which was 6, minus the number of electrons which are right around it, which is 7. So right now, this compound has a formal charge of negative 1. All right? <clears throat> the, this oxygen is in the same condition, also has a formal charge of negative 1. This carbon has uh, only 2 electrons right around it, so it brought 4 minus 2. It has a formal charge of plus 2 right now. So those formal charges, the negative 1, the negative 1, and the plus 2, are an indication that this compound is not correct. Okay? So, 
Um, what can we do to fix it? Well, we can rearrange the electron density, right? If we rearrange it and bring these two electrons on top here, maybe into a double bond, right, and form that sort of a thing, we can see that what that did was now this oxygen that brought six has right around it one, two, three, four, five, six, leaving it with a formal charge of zero. Happy atoms and compounds have no formal charge on them, all right? So we can do the same thing with these two electrons here on oxygen, bring them down to a double bond here, and that gives us this compound, right? Or that, that structure, where again, this oxygen brought six, has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons right around it, okay? And uh, again, the number of electrons that brought minus the electrons it has right around it, that equals the formal charge. Molecules with no formal charge are stable molecules. Carbon has a formal charge here of zero as well because it brought four electrons and it has one, two, three, four electrons right around it. So the formal charge on carbon there is zero. All right, so that's how we know that we've reached the right Lewis dot structure, okay? Now you take a second, you take a second and um, you take uh, uh, 90 seconds, a minute and a half, 90 seconds, and try to identify this, the Lewis dot structure for that compound, HCN. Okay? So push pause right now, push pause, and then take the 90 seconds, and then when you're done, uh, come back and see what it looks like. Okay, I'm going to show you now. So this structure, HCN, we have a central atom. The central atom is going to be the carbon. I'm going to put nitrogen and hydrogen on the outsides, right? The electrons in this, 4, 5, 9, 10, 10 electrons all together. I'm going to put some bonds here because I can see that carbon is going to need more electron density. So that ends up being the structure that's going to be good for this compound. All right, we have 10 electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. No formal charge here on nitrogen because it brought 5 and has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 available to it. No formal charge on carbon, carbon it brought 4, has 1, 2, 3, 4 available to it. All right, excellent. Now there are scenarios where there are exceptions to the central atom having eight available electrons to it. Sometimes your central atom can have more than eight available electrons to it. Now this is only the case if you're dealing with electrons or atoms that have uh, d orbitals, which means that it's in the third row or lower, the third row or lower. Elements in the top two rows here, right, they don't have d electrons, and so they can't have expanded octets. But some atoms can, or some atoms or uh, molecules, central atoms can have expanded octets. Okay? So let's look at an example of one of these. Here's a compound. It's called uh, sulfur hexafluoride. See that there? Sulfur hexafluoride. And watch the crazy stuff that sulfur hexafluoride can do. Right, so there's there's gas inside this tank. It's called sulfur hexafluoride. It's a super heavy gas. It's boring. It's boring. Watch this. I'm slowly pull the lid off. Okay. So that should be perfect. Gary, would you take that little end off over there as well? Yeah. 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 All right. So let's see if it uh, feels, feels pretty good. good. So, so let's see if we can float the boat. Okay. Let's see if we can float the boat. Stay there, little guy. So I just have it coming through a tube here, and so I'm going to give us just a little bit more so you can kind of see what's going on. Here's what they use it for. Electrical engineers will flood a room or you know part of a semiconductor or something with this material because it doesn't allow electricity to, it doesn't conduct electricity. So here's a taser. Oh, 
All right, so there's some interesting stuff. Here's another one, another use for sulfur hexafluoride. I the thing that the is the which is six times All right. So, sulfur hexafluoride, compound that, you know, we haven't heard much, much about, maybe. Um, apparently, you can breathe it in and not die. Okay. Uh, it's not conductive, right? So these are properties that have to do with the compound's shape. Now, uh, we'll explain a little bit more about how that, how you can tell that later on, but um, we can know the shape of the compound now because we're good at drawing electron dot structures, Lewis dot structures. So again, we identify the central atom, which in this case is going to be sulfur, and then we, the first thing is to distribute the number of sulfurs, six of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, around about, and then we add bonds like that. And then at this point, it's important to gather and count all the number of electrons that are brought to this party. Each fluorine brings seven, so six times seven is 42 because of the fluorines. And then the sulfur brings six. Uh, again, you can tell by where it's at in the periodic table. The sixth column over, speaking of the, thinking about the representative elements, right? So it's a total of 48 electrons. And we've added already to this compound 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 12 electrons. So now we have 36 more to distribute. And you can see that fluorine, each fluorine is going to want to take 6. That'll give it a zero formal charge. Or in other words, it brought 7 to the compound, each fluorine did. And now it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 electrons right around it, right? So each fluorine is going to need 6, and that's 6 times 6, which is 36. So there we go. We have our compound. The symmetry of this compound is what makes it uh, unreactive. It doesn't react very well. And also it's what makes it a gas. When compounds are symmetrical like this, they don't interact with their neighboring compounds, and then they form a gas easily. Okay, so let's take a look see Lou here. All right, so here's some other compounds that uh, have expanded octet, octets. XeOF4. Why don't you try that one? Now, the tricky one, part in this one here, XeOF4, try to draw this compound. But the tricky part is, for this one, identifying the central atom. Okay? Now, remember what is necessary to identify the central atom? What are the, what are the necessary, or what are the things that you look for when finding the central atom. The first thing you do is you try to <clears throat> find the atom that is least electronegative, least electronegative, that there's the fewest of, okay? Um, and in this case, you can also select the central atom by recognizing that it's going to have, let's see, there's xenon, oxygen, one, two, three, four fluorines, one central atom, that's five ligands on the outside of that central atom. And so it's not going to be able to be oxygen, right? Because the central atom here, if it was oxygen, oxygen is in the second row, means it can't have an expanded octet. So there's another way to help you identify the central atom, recognizing that if there's more than four ligands, uh, which would provide eight electrons, uh, then there's not going to be uh, a possibility for the central atom to be from the second call, second row. So you try to make this this compound here. I'll give you 90 seconds to try to do that. All right. So push pause and work on that now, and then come right back. Okay. All right. Did you do it? If you didn't, stop. Go ahead and take it. Take your opportunity to do it. But what we have here is we have xenon in the middle oxygen, and then four fluorines, one, two, three, four. We count up the electron, well, we draw our bonds first, and then we count up the electron density. Oxygen brought six, 
four floorings. That's uh, seven times four, 28. And then xenon is eight. So 28, 34, 44, no, 34, 42. 42 electrons altogether. We have one, two, three, four, five, ten 10 electrons already put on there. So we have 32 electrons left. So I can do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 22, 24, 5, 6, 7, 28, 29, 30. And then it looks like I need to put 31, 32 on xenon. Okay, if you have left, F, leftover electron density, it goes on to the central atom. Now, <clears throat> we can start looking at this structure that we have. And, you know, usually after you place the electrons, you're not done. Um, and so we can tell whether or not we need to shift around electron density by looking at the formal charges on these atoms. This oxygen here, this, these fluorines don't have a formal charge. They brought seven and they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons right around them. But this oxygen brought six and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons right around them. So that's a problem. That one needs to be adjusted, right? And we can adjust it by bringing these top two electrons and making a double bond there. So it's going to be like this now. All right, with the, I didn't draw all the, we can draw one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. There it is, that's the compound. All right, very good. Why don't you draw SBCL5? All right, stop, push pause right now, take your time, do it right, draw it. Okay, if you got it. Okay, I'm gonna show you now. If you haven't got it yet, take your time and do it right. SBCL1, two, three, four, five, count up electrons. 7 times 5, 35, plus antimony, that is uh, 5, so there's 40 electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, we already have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 10, so we only have 30 more to go. 6 times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 6 times 5, that's 30 electrons. 930. All right, so 8 times 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8 times 5 is 40. So there was a total of 40 electrons, and now we have it finished. Okay, very good. Uh, now, all the compounds that we draw in this core, or in this course, yes, all the compounds that we draw are going to have central atoms with ligands on the outside, except for one different kind. We're going to introduce to you just one kind of branched compound. And this one kind of branched compound is always the a cation or anion of a poly uh no a, an oxy acid an oxy acid now i don't know if you remember some of your oxy acids but this compound right here this is a uh, polyatomic ion of an oxy acid it's the carbonate ion with one proton but it could have a second proton to form carbonic acid all right polyatomic ions of oxy acids are uh, acids, right, without hydrogens. And the hydrogens, one of the reasons why we call them oxy acids is because the hydrogens interact with the oxygens in these compounds. So when I'm going to draw this, I'm going to have, and this is the only scenario where we have any branching, so to speak. The central atom is carbon. I'm going to have my three oxygens around about it. And the hydrogen is going to be coming off of the oxygen, okay? Now, how did we know that? Well, I'm telling you now that oxy acids or polyatomic ions of oxy acids always have the hydrogens coming off of the oxygens, okay? So that is the extent that we have to know in terms of branching compounds, but the hydrogens won't come off central atoms in polyatomic ions or of, of um, oxy acids, all right? So if, if we wanna finish this one up now after we have the skeleton, we count the electron density and you try to distribute it. So I'm gonna give you a second now, I've helped you out with the skeleton. You go ahead and finish this up. Count the electrons, distribute them appropriately, look for formal charges on all the, the atoms. All right, go. All 
all right? Hopefully you took some time to do it. If you didn't take some time to do it, stop the video right now and do it. Uh, let's see, how many electrons do we have here? 1, 2, 3, 6 times 3, 18, plus 4, 22, plus hydrogen, 23. Now, whenever there's an odd number, you should be hesitant because compounds don't generally have odd numbers. This negative sign on here is an indication that there's an extra electron. And so, whenever you have a charge, a negative charge, you add electron density. If it was a positive charge, you would remove an electron. So that's negative one, so it's an additional electron, so a total of 24 electrons. We have already written on this compound one, two, three, four electrons, all right? And um, we have, therefore, 20 more to distribute. And I'll begin to distribute them here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Wait, 24, did I miss some? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, 24. Yeah, that's it, 24. I have all 24 on there now. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 24 minus 4. Where did I get 4? Oh, yeah, it should have been 24 minus 8. Sorry. So it's 16 that I have left. It's two electrons for each bond. Okay. So there's my compound, but I see that this has a formal charge, and this has a formal charge, and carbon also has a formal charge, so I need to adjust things. You can count the formal charges on there. I'm going to give you a few moments to find out what their formal charges are. Very important. Definitely going to be questions on the exam where you have to find the formal charge for atoms within a compound. Okay, what's the formal charges? Did you find it? Push pause and find it if you haven't already. The formal charge on this oxygen here is a minus 1. On this oxygen here, minus one, and on this carbon here, a plus one. Okay? So I'm going to adjust the electron density. I'll take a couple electrons here, move them into a bond there, right? And form this double bond like that. Carbon then. All right. Now carbon has no formal charge here. This oxygen has a formal charge. What about the formal charge there? Can I bring these electrons in to form another double bond? I can't because carbon is in the second row and can't have an expanded octet. It can't have more than eight electrons available to it. Therefore, this carbon has this this is the best it's going to get. <clears throat> and there remains a negative one formal charge on that oxygen atom. But that's all right as well because we're dealing with a polyatomic ion and there is a negative charge on this compound. Also, if I were to take this this chemical HCO3 minus and add a proton to it to form H2CO3, right? If I were to do that, then this proton here would attach to this oxygen right here. Positively charged proton would come interact with this negatively charged oxygen right there. So that's exactly where the negative charge should be for this compound. Okay, so Let's see. Why don't you take a look at this one? What's the formal charge on HSO3 minus? HSO3 minus. That's a good one to practice. Why don't you guys take a look at that one? I'll give you uh, 60 seconds to try to solve that one. Go ahead and turn it off and take your time. Okay, you got it. Push pause if you haven't finished it up yet. And then, um, how are we going to do this? You have to draw the Lewis dot structure, all right? If you need to draw the Lewis dot structure, go ahead and push pause again and draw the Lewis dot structure and then try to figure it out. All right? So if, you, if you've done now, hopefully you've finished. Don't cheat. Go do it and finish it. Central atom sulfur, three oxygens, one, two, three, and then a hydrogen. Now, should I draw the hydrogen coming off of this sulfur right here? No, because this is an oxy acid, polyatomic ion of an oxy acid, so we have H coming off there. All right, so there's a skeleton. We count up electron density. One, two, three, four things brought six. That's 24 plus one, 25. But we also have a negative charge here. So a total of 26 electrons in this compound. 26 electrons. Okay. And uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight already out there. A total of 18 left to put. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. All right, so um, 
sulfur here, one, two, three, four, five electrons right around it, but it brought six, so it needs one more electron right around it. And this has a formal charge of negative one here. This one has a formal charge of positive one, the sulfur, and this one has a negative one. So we have some fixing we can do on this compound. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring some couple of electrons in here to form a double bond. That'll alleviate this negative charge and that positive charge. All right, and so we're going to have sulfur, oxygen, like so. All right. There's no formal charge here now, no formal charge here. Oh wait, I forgot about these lone pair electrons that are still there. That's how we get the one, two, three, four, five, six electrons around sulfur. Uh, negative one charge here on that compound. So what's the formal charge on the sulfur? It's zero. There's no formal charge on that sulfur. Okay, very good. So one other thing that I'm gonna talk about now is what we call resonance structures, resonance structures. Compounds have resonance structures when their molecules can be drawn in multiple ways. So here we see an example of uh, the nitrate ion, right? Here's the nitrate ion, NO3 minus. It can be drawn with the double bond on one of, between the nitrogen and one of the oxygens, or a different oxygen, or even a third oxygen. Now, the thing to recognize about um, uh, resonance structures is that any one of these resonance structures could be occurring at the same time. In fact, it's not that one exists more than the other. It's, it's that all three, or that the actual compound is a mixture of all three, okay? So that it's constantly fluctuating between all three of these. So it's important to recognize because what it tells us is that the electron density on the atoms within molecules is very fluid. It can transfer and move all around the molecules. All right. So if you were to look at the whether or not there's a double bond between, for example, this oxygen and this nitrogen, or this oxygen and this nitrogen, or this oxygen and this nitrogen, it would all this one would be a double bond, and this one be these ones be two single bonds. All three of them would actually look like um, hybrids between this double bond and the single bond. Okay. So. <clears throat> That's what you get when you have what we call uh, hybrid, sorry, uh, resonance structures. All right, so here's a con here's a uh, example for you. Which of the compounds shown here, A, B, C, or D, is the best structure for the sulfate ion? All right, so take a few moments, take two minutes, try to find out what the best structure is for the sulfate ion. All right, push pause and go and do it right. All right, if you had trouble with that one, here's a hint. You can tell the best structure by the one that has the, the fewest number and the lowest charge in terms of formal charges. So anytime you're asked to identify a good structure, you're looking for the number of formal charges on the compound. Okay, so if you didn't do that yet, go back and do it again. All right, so... If you did measure all the formal charges on all these atoms in here, you'd find that C is the best compound because sulfur here has no formal charge. This oxygen has no formal charge. This one has no formal charge, but these two have negative one formal charges. Here we have three, one, two, three, and then the fourth atom. All four of those have formal charges. So in this scenario, we just have two things with formal charges. Here we have one, two, three, four, five elements, all the elements have formal charges. Here we have uh, this element with a formal charge and that element with a formal charge. But, and that, that sometimes becomes a question, where do formal charges like to reside? If there's a choice on where they can reside, they prefer to reside on the more electronegative atom, which is always also going to be uh, an atom on the edge because, like we said previously, central atoms like to be the least electronegative one. So, C is the answer. Very good. All right. So now, um, moving on to chapter 10. Okay. Um, chapter 10. Let's see. We got to fix this here.
chapter 10 uh, looks further into the shapes of the molecules, further into the shapes of the molecules, okay? And uh, the shapes of the molecules are, again, determined by how the electrons are arranged around the central atom, all right? So we have our first compound here, CH4, shown up here in the, the uh, top right, CH4. Um, and this compound has four ligands on it, right? Four hydrogen ligands on it, all right? Three of them form a trigonal base for a pyramid that looks something like that, okay? And this is called a, uh, 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 well, you think of it as a, a trigonal pyramid, but the shape that it results in has four sides. If you were to think of it as a dice, like you're playing a game and you're rolling this dice, it actually has four sides. And so uh, they named this structure a tetrahedral. Tetra, tetra meaning four, tetrahedral. Okay? Um, water here. H2O, right? It's it has around its central atom again one, two, three, four regions of electron density. Four regions of electron density, just like methane does or CH4 does. Water has four regions of electron density. Two of them, however, are not bonding regions, but are non-bonding regions. Now, we talked about already the angle between uh, elements or compounds when there's four regions of electron density. So if you have a central atom, central whatever, and four things coming off it, they all try to arrange themselves in space at an angle of 109.5 degrees from each other. All right? And so that's the 109.5 degrees here as well, 109.5 degrees. Well, these four regions, the two lone pairs and the two hydrogens, also assume 109.5 degrees distance from each other. Okay? Now, um, the actual resulting shape of this compound is going to be different because all you see is this part if you're looking right at the compound. However, the angle that the four regions take, again, is the same as in the methane. Okay? So, um, we see that what's most important about determining the shape of the molecule, especially when we have these small molecules with the central atom and stuff around the outside, is the number of regions of electron density around the central atom. So, for example, here we have nitrogen, and then there's one, two, three, four regions of electron density. So, again, these four regions of electron density would assume an angle of 109.5 from each other, all right? So how many regions of electron density are around oxygen, do we say, in water? One, two, three, four. Good. How about this iodine here? How many regions of electron density are around this iodine? So count them up. Get a number in your head. All right. Is it five? Did you think five? That's right. One, two, three, four, five. Five regions of electron density. How about this one down here? carbon dioxide. How many regions of electron density? All right, get a number in your mind. It's two, right? Two regions of electron density. Very good. All right, so valent shell pair repulsion theory, or VESPER, uh, is the idea, which we've already talked about, that regions of electron density are going to try to get as far away as possible from each other when they're ordered around a central atom. Okay, so here are the shapes that we have. Uh, that the here are the shapes that the the molecules, the, the different shapes that molecules will take, and we're going to kind of name these. Now, I want you to recognize that the names that these uh, atoms take are pretty much what their shapes are. And you know, if you have a hard time kind of describing the shape, um, it's okay if you're off a little bit because it's just the shape that's important. Um, so let's go through and name these, and you'll recognize that their names are just what they are. This one here is, is linear, 
right? It's linear, so we call it a linear shape. This one here we've talked about already as before as well. You have a central atom of three regions of electron density, and the easiest way for three regions to get away from each other are at an angle of 120 degrees. And this is a triangle, but it's all on the same plane. So we call it trigonal planar, trigonal planar. This one here we just talked about as well, central atom, four regions of electron density, 109.5 degrees. Four sides to this thing if it was considered a, a die for playing a game. And that's called a tetrahedral, tetrahedral. All right, this is a new one. This is a new one. When there's five regions of electron density. If you notice, five regions of electron density, and uh, we'll get close to this one right here five regions of electron density, you have one region up, one region down, and then we call those in the axial positions, and then three in what we call equatorial positions. So if you were to think about this kind of as a, a, a kind of like a globe where there's a central atom, one up in the north and south poles, and then three kind of in the, the equator or the equatorial positions around the, the central atom, right? So the three that are around the central atom on the equator are 120 degrees from each other, but the two up and down are 180 from each other and 90 degrees from the equator. So the axial ones are 90 degrees from the equator. This shape is called trigonal bipyramidal, trigonal bipyramidal, because this triangle in the middle can be thought of as a base forming a pyramid. So you have this dotted line forming a pyramid on top, but it also forms a pyramid down below. So it's called bipyramidal for that reason. The next shape where you have a central atom in six regions of electron density is a little, uh, its name is kind of a shame because it get, can get confusing. If you say octahedral, you think, oh, eight, there must be eight ligands. But it's not that there is eight ligands, it's that there's eight uh, sides if, again, you think of this as a plane dice. Okay, so if this was a dice, it would have eight sides. So that's where it gets the name octahedral. Now, as we mentioned, regions of electron density, whether they're bonding, as shown here at the top, or non-bonding, as they're shown at the bottom, still take up space. So if we have a compound like water here, right, two hydrogens, and then two regions of lone pairs, electron density, right, non-bonding domain, they take up space. In fact, they take up more space. You see how this is a little bit bigger? It's a little bit bigger than bonding, than, than electron density between two nuclei, because here the nuclei bring in the electron density a little bit tighter, but here it spreads out more. And what that does is that spreading of these electrons and this electron density ends up pushing these bonds a little bit closer to each other. So when you have a compound like this, where there's four regions of electron density, you would initially think, oh, the distance here is 109.5, but it ends up being a little bit less than 109.5 because we have the lone pair electron density there. So from now on, whenever there's an angle like this and two lone pairs that would be crowding that angle, we'll say it's a little less than 109.5. All right, so what's the geometry of the SO2 compound? You go ahead and, and, and take a look, all right? See if you can find the geometry of the SO2 compound. Let's see, did we... All right, the SO2. So what you're going to have to do is draw it. You're going to have to draw it. After you draw it, then you can see what its shape would be. So I'll give you a second to draw it. 90 seconds. Push pause. Okay, hopefully you took a second to draw, uh, time to draw it. The SO2 compound is going to have, again, central atom sulfur. Where are we at? Okay, central atom sulfur, uh, oxygen and oxygen. All right, uh, six times three, 18 electrons altogether, right? Uh, one, two, three, four electrons already, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Let's see, did I miss some? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Did I say six times three, 18? 15, 16, 17, 18. Did I do that right? So it looks like this compound 
have to rearrange the electron density a little bit. Looks like I'm going to bring these electrons in here to form a double bond. And um, I can't bring these ones into here to form a double bond because that would be too many electrons for atom oxygen. But I can bring these electrons in here to form a double bond. So I'm going to do that. And then there's these two electrons still left on the central atom. So I might think that this compound is like carbon dioxide, right? That looks like this. And the angle here for carbon dioxide is 180 degrees, and this is a linear compound. But it's not, because we have lone pair electron density there. It means that there's one, two, three regions, right? And so the sulfur, the two oxygens, and the region of electron density, that lone pair there, looks like this. And we have that this is now at 120 degrees, or a little less than 120 degrees, because there's a lone pair squishing it. And uh, the shape of this compound here is called bent. It's called bent because um, of that extra lone pair density there. All right. So that's what we see here. We see that when you have an, uh, a set of lone pair electrons, when you have a set, uh, let's see, let's see. When you have a set of lone pair electrons on the on a trigonal planar compound, if one of them is one of the ligands is a lone pair electrons, the resulting compound is a bent compound with an angle of 120 degrees. All right. If we have a tetrahedral compound, as we discussed already, and one of them becomes a set of lone pair electrons, the resulting compound is called a trigonal planar. Trigonal planar, you can see how it's, sorry, not trigonal planar, trigonal pyramidal. You see how it has a triangular base and it forms a pyramid. All right. This compound here, two regions of electron density being non bonding, four altogether, two of them bonding, two of them non bonding. That is bent, like our water molecule. We've already talked about that one. All right. What about five regions of electron density? Again, when you have five regions of electron density, those five regions attain a what we call a trigonal bipyramidal shape. Okay, so here's our trigonal bipyramidal shape: central atom, two axial, and then three equatorial. All right. Now it ends up being kind of significant, kind of important as to what what um, atom will be replaced by a lone pair electron when it comes to the trigonal bipyramidal molecular shape. And that's because some electron some atoms in this scenario uh, have more electron or more space. And because there's more space required for a lone pair of electrons like this, it's always going to go to the spots where there's more space. And if you think about it, the axial atoms have three neighbors, all of them 90 degrees from each other, while this atom here has two neighbors that are 90 degrees, but two others that are 120 degrees. So the atoms on the equator end up having more space, and the lone pair electrons are going to go to the atoms along the equator. Okay, so if I put in one lone pair electron of electrons, it's going to replace an equatorial atom and the result is this shape. This shape is called a distorted tetrahedron or a seesaw. A seesaw. Okay? If I have a second pair of electron density, it's going to replace a second equatorial atom, and it's going to result in what we call a T-shaped. If I have three regions of electron density, then it's going to result in a linear compound because all three equatorial locations are now empty. No uh, ligands binding them. In an octahedral geometry, this, we can call it axial, but it's really not any more axial than any of these. Because if you were to grab any one of these atoms and pull it to the bottom, it would make the same shape. So it ends up being insignificant in terms of which atom is going to be replaced with lone pair of electrons um, if there's lone pair of electrons in this compound. 
So it doesn't matter. They're all equally uh, um, distant from each other. There's no one spot that has more space. So if we end up replacing one uh, atom with lone pair electron density, it makes this shape, which is called a square pyramid. All right, pretty uh, self-explanatory. Two readings of electron density and, uh, uh, results in a square plane. Another region of electron density would result in a T-shape. And then four regions of lone pair electron density would end up having just a, uh, a linear shape. All right, here we go then. So why don't you take us, um, this is going to take you probably three good minutes to identify the shape of all of these compounds, okay? All right, what is the shape of all of these compounds? Now, it's important to recognize the number of regions of electron density and identify what shape those regions will take, but then also to identify the shape of the compound itself. So, push pause, go ahead and take three minutes, and then go do that, okay? All right, so... Um, if we look at NH3 here, NH3, all right, if we look at NH3 here, first we have to draw the structure. We have to draw the structure out for ourselves. Well, I guess... You know, you, you don't need to. If you can recognize here that there are one, two, three, four regions of electron density, then I think it probably becomes helpful for us to draw it, right? If we recognize here that we have a um, nitrogen and we have three hydrogens coming down like this and then a lone pair electron density there, I see that there's four regions of electron density so the angle here is going to be 109.5, and the resulting shape is a, a pyramid with a triangular base. Okay? So this compound's shape is trigonal pyramidal. All right, how about this one, CH4? That one is going to end up being like this, right? Again... We have our trigonal base, but this time we have a nice top to the pyramid. So this is a four-sided structure, and that helps us remember that this one is called tetrahedral. But you can think of the tetra as well uh, as four things bonding to a central atom, right? All right. How about this one over here, carbon dioxide? Two regions of electron density, that's all. So that one is linear, linear. This compound here, now what is this thing here? How many regions of electron density? One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Once you see that there's five regions of electron density, you can draw what a five region electron density structure looks like. Okay? So we know that there's a central atom. We can call that an iodine if we want to. We have five regions. Well, what do five regions do? Well, that means that there's two axial and three coming off in equatorial conditions, all right? Uh, of these five regions, we can take a look right here. Of these five regions, three are non-bonding pairs. And we know that in a five um, ligand system where there's uh, equatorial regions and axial regions, right? That's the only scenario where we have that. The non-bonding pairs like to go to the equatorial region where there's more space. So it results in a compound, whoops, that's an iodine there. Here's an iodine there, right? Uh, a linear shaped compound, right? So this one ends up being linear. So don't get confused into thinking it's bent because it looks like somebody drew it bent. Those lone pairs are in the equatorial positions and we have a linear compound. All right. What would we predict the bond angle would be between the hydrogens here in this water molecule? Take a moment and go check that out. What would you predict the hydrogen angle in the hydrogens would be? Okay, hopefully you had a second. If not, push pause. But I'll tell you, 
The angle here is a little less than 109.5. There's four regions of electron density, tetrahedral shape in terms of the regions of electron density. The actual molecule itself is just a bent molecule, but there's four regions of electron density, so that means this is going to be a little, or 109.5, but with these lone pairs, it's going to be a little less than 109.5. The actual angle for a water molecule, here it comes, drum roll. I've been drawing water molecules for you all year. Whoops, where is it at? Oh, it doesn't say here? I thought it said on this one. Oh, I have the wrong slides open. Let me open up um, the right ones here. Mm, sorry. There it is. Ah. Design, no, no, uh, slideshow, sorry. There we go. Here it is. The angle is 104.5. There you go. A little less than 109.5. Okay. So. Um, which requires more space? Bonding, lone pairs, both the same. You should know that one. If you don't, you can take a few seconds to think about it. Push pause, though, because I'm going to tell you it's lone pairs, right? Lone pairs don't have two nuclei to report to. They just have their own space to take up. Therefore, lone pairs, or sorry, lone pairs require more space. They take up more space. Okay, which bond angles are closer in a trigonal bipyramidal structure? Actually, axial bonds or equatorial bonds? Which bond angles are closer? So, for example, an axial axial bond, that's A, equatorial axial, and equatorial equatorial, or there's no difference when we're talking about uh, trigonal bipyramidal. In other words, they're all the same. You take a second answer to this one, you've got 35 seconds. Okay, as you take the time, make sure you find an answer. Which bond angles are closer in this one? B, an equatorial axial angle is closer, right? That's how many degrees? Well, five regions of the electron, sorry, uh, trigonal bipyramidal, and that means it's this thing right here. Well, I don't need to draw that one. I can start over. Five angles of electron density, five regions of electron density, sorry, uh, one coming up, one coming down, and then three in the equatorial regions, right? So again, this angle right here is 90 degrees, right? All the equatorial to axial angles are 90 degrees. Okie dokie. What's the molecular ge geometry of the electron domains around carbon in CH4? Carbon in CH4. All right. Four regions of electron density. That's going to be a tetrahedral shape. Okay. Very good. Now. Polar molecules. Now we've talked a little bit about polar bonds. Polar bonds occur when you have a discrepancy in sharing of electron density. Okay, so um, this is the example of a bond where there's a discrepancy in sharing of electron density. Right? You have, for example, a carbon and an oxygen. Now, how do I know there's a discrepancy in sharing electron density? The word is electronegativity, electronegativity. Carbon and oxygen have different electronegativities, and so the electron density here is trying to flow towards the oxygen, okay? Now we've talked about electron discrepancies, or bond polarity is what we call it, a polar bond here, but when it comes to compounds, you sometimes polar bonds don't always result in a compound itself having an uneven distribution of electron density. And here we'll explain why. Water is a polar compound, and the polar bonds in water are significant and influence the structure of the compound. Same thing with ammonia, NH3. And that's because in both of these compounds, the molecule is not symmetrically shaped. Not symmetrically shaped, right? You have 
oxygen up and above the hydrogens, and here you have nitrogen above the hydrogens as well. And so the resulting electronegative pull of oxygen in this case and nitrogen in this case pulls the electron density towards one side of the compound. Now that's not the case for all compounds. Here's carbon dioxide. The electron density does not go just to one side. It goes evenly throughout because it's trying to be pulled back and forth by the oxygens. So you have a nonpolar compound. Same here with S or BCl3 or uh, CCl4. All these scenarios. The electron density is being pulled, but it's not being pulled just to one side. It's being pulled and distributed evenly throughout the whole molecule. Okay? So, we now have a way to describe not just polar bonds, but what we call polar molecules. Polar molecules. Molecules can be polar. <coughs> to be polar, they have to have a polar bond in them, but they also have to have an uneven distribution of the electron density due to that polar bond. Or, in other words, an asymmetric shape. Another way to look at these polar molecules here, they're all asymmetric. All right, They have some symmetry, some symmetry this direction, but not symmetry this direction. This compound has symmetry this direction and symmetry that direction. Same here, there's many ways of uh, identifying symmetry in these compounds. And the result is a non-polar compound. All right, so let's look at these three and try to identify polar or non-polar. Here we have a compound where there's oxygen with electron density being pulled to different sides. This compound, this side of the compound here does not have a pole of electron density, whoops, but this side does. So this is an example of a polar compound. This side here, this one here, the electron density is being pulled down from this central atom. So yes, another example of a polar compound. This compound here these two sides of the compound are essentially the same thing. And so electron density is not going to be evenly or unevenly distributed, resulting in a non-polar compound. Okay? Another way to think about compounds is not just about the whole compound, but little sections of the compound. So benzoyl peroxide, this is a good medication for getting rid of zits and stuff like that. Uh, kills bacteria on your face pretty good. So, this compound has polar regions and has nonpolar regions. You can tell the polar regions because there's an oxygen pulling the electron density away, and you can see the nonpolar regions as well because there's no oxygens here, just carbons and hydrogens. All right, so polar regions aren't always just associated with um, one or a molecule, a whole molecule, or something like that. It can be associated with certain sections on molecules as well. Okay, so let's see here. Um, when we think about sharing electron density between two atoms, right, we think about an overlap of, electron, of, of atomic orbital electron density. Now, we've, we've already mentioned this before, that you can't just overlap atomic orbitals and get the compound uh, shape the correct way. That's what Lewis dot structures are for to help us identify what the shape of the electrons are, of, of, of molecules are. But now we have to kind of discuss a little bit about um, how this is occurring. What, what, are the, what are the orbitals doing? Or, or what model do we have to explain what the orbitals are doing when they form the compounds that they form? And valence bond theory allows us to do this, okay? Um, well, let's see here. Let's have... We don't need to, we talked about this already, about how, for example, if you have, um, if you're just overlapping atomic orbitals, you would expect certain structures to, to result, and sometimes it works, and H2S is an example where it works, but almost any other compound, it doesn't end up working. So, um, what we have to introduce is what we call hybridization, hybridization. Hybridization, hybridizing, means we're taking two things together and making new entities from them. And when two atoms or multiple atoms come together to form molecules, we have a model of explaining the, the resulting orbitals where electron densities reside as hybridization. Okay? 
Now, the way that this works is uh, you think about the atoms coming together. Excuse me. You think about the atoms coming together, sharing all their electron density into a pot or something, and then um, taking those electrons, that electron density, and forming new, what we call hybrid orbitals. Hybrid orbitals. So, here's some examples. All right. If we have an atom coming together like oxygen, wanting to bind with two hydrogens, okay? So here's one hydrogen, and then here's another hydrogen, and we're going to bond these atoms together. Well, oxygen, we can think about what its atom looks like. It has a 1s, and then it has a 2s, and then it has two or three of these 2p orbitals around it. Hydrogen just has, each one just has a 1s orbital around it. We can think about the hybrid orbital that re will result by thinking about the number of regions of electron density that are necessary around the central atom in the compound that we're forming. Okay? So, here's oxygen. And here's two hydrogens. They're going to come together. We can draw the Lewis dot structure now. They're going to come together to form this compound. Okay? This compound needs one, two, three, four regions of electron density extending from this oxygen. Okay? How is it going to get four regions of electron density extending from that oxygen? Well, if we were just thinking about the atom, we would say, oh, it's these p orbitals. But now that we're recognizing that uh, you can't just look at the atomic orbitals on an element, you have to combine them together and make hybridized orbitals. What we describe, or our hybridization model for describing this, says that this oxygen is going to take its orbitals that it, that it or it's going to take four of its atomic orbitals and make one, two, three, for what we call hybrid orbitals, four hybrid orbitals, okay? Now, if it's going to take the four uh, orbitals, which orbitals is it going to have to take? Well, it has, a, again, what are the orbitals that it has available to it? It has a, a 2s orbital available to it, and it has uh, three of these 2p orbitals available to it, right? That's what oxygen has available to it. So, to make four regions of electron density, four hybrid orbitals extending from that central oxygen in, in the water molecule. To make four regions of electron density, it's going to need four regions, uh, or four uh, atomic orbitals. So it takes four atomic orbitals and forms hybrid orbitals that extend out from this oxygen in this compound. Okay? And the four orbitals that it takes, it takes one of these two S's and then one, two, three, of these two P's. And it puts them into a hat. I'll draw the hat for you. It takes this, this 2S, here's the 2S, and here's the, the, the three 2P orbitals. All of them go together into a hat. Right? And then out come one, two, three, four. Four went in, so out come four, what we call hybrid orbitals. All right? And the shape of these hybrid orbitals have a large dumbbell on one side and a very small bit of electron density on the other. And they all come out looking the same. One, two, three, four. And now we need to name them. We need to name them so we can describe them to other people. What's the name of these new hybrid orbitals that we made? Well, we could name them uh, Peter. I'm a fond of that name. I, I like John or maybe Stuart. Stuart's a good name. Or maybe we should name them after their parents, their parents, which were the S and the, the three P orbitals that came together to form them. Okay. So the names of these hybrid orbitals that are formed are going to be called S, P, 3, because those are the atomic orbitals that had to come together to form the hybrid orbitals. Okay. 
So hybrid orbital seems tricky on the surface, or sorry, yes, tricky on the surface, but when you get to it, it's very straightforward and easy to remember. The only thing that you have to do is to recognize the compound. So for example, here is a compound. Its Lewis dot structure will tell you how many regions of electron density there are, right? And from the number of regions of electron density, you can identify the hybrid orbitals that must be extending from that central atom. So here we have one, two, three, four, five regions of electron density. That means we need five atomic orbitals to go into the hat. All right. So what would be the atomic orbitals that would go into this hat? Well, it's going to start off with an S. It's going to go through its P's. And then it's going to need one, two, three, four, five atomic orbitals. So there's S, three P's, and then it's going to have to dip into the D's. Now there's five D's, right? But we only need one of them. So the names of these hybrid orbitals are going to be SP3D. SP3D. The shape of the hybrid orbitals, again, the same. Small lobe, large lobe. There's five of them, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and they're called sp3d hybrid orbitals. So to identify the hybrid orbitals that are on a specific element or in a compound, you identify the number of regions of electron density and then name them based on how many atomic orbitals must have gone together to make those hybrid orbitals. Okay, so this shows here the structures. For example, here's S, three P's. They come together to form four sp3 hybrid orbitals. If you take an S and two P's, they come together to form three sp2 hybrid orbitals, and they leave behind an extra P orbital. Same thing with S and P. You can just bring them together to form sp hybrid orbitals and leave behind two extra P orbitals. Okay, so hybridization is just a way to for us to understand how the electrons are extended from element to element within a compound All right so just like before where the shapes of the compounds were based on the number of regions of electron density even though we start describing things in terms of hybrid orbitals the shapes of the compounds still are dependent on the number of regions of electron density in other words, if I have two hybrid orbitals, like if I have a compound like carbon dioxide, two regions of electron density extending from this carbon, that means there's two hybrid orbitals necessary to be extending from this carbon. Two hybrid orbitals. What are those hybrid orbitals? Well, if there's just two, what must have gone into the hat to form the two? Right? To form the two compounds, what or two, two hybrid orbitals, what had to go into the hat? It must have been an S and then a P. So extending from this carbon, we have, and I can draw it here, draw a little carbon like this. We have one sp hybrid orbital, and then we have another sp hybrid orbital extending this way. And they're overlapping with the oxygen atoms. Uh, in this case, it's going to be, what do we have here? three regions of electron density. So that means into the hat must have gone, in that case, three S and two P's. So we have sp2 hybrid orbitals around this oxygen atom here, sp2. So this is small lobe, large lobe. And then we have two small lobe, large lobes going off in this direction, which are full of lone pair electron density. Okay, same on this side, sp2. orbitals, one of them overlapping with this carbon, this carbon's sp hybrid orbitals, and the other two extending in with lone pair electron density. Okay? All right. So, in a CH4 compound, you have four regions of electron density around the carbon. The hybridization, therefore, is, if I have four regions, that must be that carbon had to have four atomic orbitals go in. What would be those atomic orbitals? Well, 
they would be, let's see, carbon would have an S, and then it needs three more, so three P's, so an SP3 hybrid orbital is going in there, okay? So that would mean that the angles would be 109.5, four regions of electron density extending from that carbon, and they'd be extending in the form of SP3 hybrid orbitals, the hydrogen bringing in the 1S, and the 1S overlaps with those SP3 hybrid orbitals. So, in the compound CH3OH, what's the expected hybridization for the oxygen? Well, to answer this question, you have to draw the electron dot structure of CH3OH first, and then you have to, or you have to know the structure of, of CH3OH, and then we're going to identify how many regions of electron density are around that oxygen, and then answer the question. Okay? So, take a shot at it. Try to draw CH3OH. Try to count the number of regions of electron density around the oxygen. And identify what the hybrid orbitals that are extending from the oxygen must be called based on the number of regions of electron density. Ready? Go. Are you done? If not, push pause. If you're done, let's work on it together then. Okay, here's what it looks like. Carbon, oxygen, three hydrogens, CH, H, and then an H coming off of that oxygen. Okay, so this is what this compound looks like. Um, we count up all the electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There should be 14 altogether, though. 11, 12, 13, 14. There we go. There's all our electrons now. Okay, right? 6, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So, what does this mean? Well, this means that around the oxygen, I have one, two, three, four regions of electron density. That means the hat must have had four atomic orbitals, an S and three P's in there. So the atomic orbitals that are extending from the oxygen are in the form of sp3 hybrid orbitals. Okay? sp3 hybrid orbitals. Very good. So, <sighs> what's the hybridization around this carbon? Three regions of electron density, right? So what's the hybridization? sp2 hybrid, obviously. What's the hybridization around this carbon here? Take a second, try to figure it out. Do you got it? Wait till you get it. Push pause. All right, around that our carbon right there, it's sp3 hybrid orbitals because we have carbon extending one, two, three, four regions of electron density. That results in hybrid orbitals, sp3 hybrid orbitals, okay? This, uh, this nitrogen here, how many regions of electron density? What are the hybrid orbitals? Go ahead and figure it out. Take your time, push pause. All right, what is it? It's sp3 hybridized as well. All right, very good. Now, when we have an expanded octet, which is more than four regions of electron density, that's when we start going to the d orbitals. So if there's five regions, then our hybrid orbitals that we we're describing have an s, three p's, and a d necessary to get five regions of electron density. And six regions of electron density, sp3, d2. Those are, that is, those are the hybrid orbitals when there's six regions of electron density. Now, there are different kinds of bonds that describe the types of overlaps of electron orbitals, okay? There are different kinds of bonds. There are bonds that overlap um, S orbitals. For example, two s orbitals overlapping, and that's what we see here. There are bonds that overlap two p orbitals, but at this angle, where the p orbitals are lying uh, kind of in the same plane, well, not in the same plane necessarily, but they're lying, what is that, parallel? Not parallel to each other. Uh, head to toe, head to toe, that's one way to say it kind of thing. Whoops. And then there's also 
when you have hybrid orbitals lying head to toe to each other as well, or head to head, right? All of these scenarios up here are called sigma bonds because they're similar to this SS overlap, and sigma is the letter S in the Greek alphabet. So here we have an SS overlap, a PP overlap, but it's kind of like the two bulbs are little S's, and then two hybrid overlaps, but again, the bulbs are like little S's. So all of these are called sigma bonds. But there's also another kind of bond, a bond where two p orbitals overlap, but now they're not head to toe, but they're kind of head to head and toe to toe, right? Or in other words, they're they're angled, they're right parallel to each other. It's kind of hard to describe, right? Because they're not, and these are parallel up here as well, right? So, but when the p orbitals are overlapped like this, then we call it a, a, a pi bond. Pi because that's the Greek letter P. And that's the, the yeah in the Greek alphabet, pi is the, the letter for P. So you have sigma bonds and pi bonds, right? Now let's describe what we what we're seeing here using this molecule here. Okay, so here I have a compound. It's a carbon double bound to another carbon like so. We have a double bond there. Now we're going to try to describe what this double bond is using this hybrid hybridization, this orbital hybridization model. Okay. Around this carbon there are one, two, three regions of electron density. So what's the hybridization that's going on here? Three regions, S and two P's. So this is an sp2 hybridized carbon extending from itself three sp2 hybrid orbitals. I'm going to try to draw that. Well, I don't need to draw it. It's right here. It's drawn right here. See these two, these purple sp2 hybrid orbitals extending from the carbon? There's three of them extending from the carbon. And this neighboring carbon over here also one, two, three regions of electron density. So those are sp2 hybrid orbitals extending from that carbon. And here we can see them in purple, the two, the three sp2 hybrid orbitals extending. And if you bring these atoms close together, then they will bond together like that. They'll get a sigma overlap, an overlap between two bulbous regions like that. Okay, and that's a, a bond. Another thing that happens, though, is the leftover p orbitals. Now, why are there leftover p orbitals on those carbons? Well, it was because this carbon only needed three regions of electron density, so it only used one s and two p orbitals, but it left behind its third p orbital, right? Left behind its third p orbital. And that leftover p orbital is free to bond with any other leftover free p orbitals, which are on neighboring atoms. And so that results in a second bond occurring, or a pi bond occurring. So here the sigma bond is underneath, but you have the pi bond showing up on top and also on bottom. So the overlap occurs between the lobe on top and the lobe on bottom. And that is represented when we draw a molecule like so, right? carbon and carbon form one bond here. So one of these bonds represents the sigma overlap between the sp2 hybrid orbitals, but the second bond there represents the overlap between the leftover pi orbitals. Okay, So now I'm going to draw this just basically the same thing here, but talk ourselves through it so we kind of have an idea of what's going on here. Okay, All right, a, a little bit of a review to, to, to get another shot at understanding what's going on. So again, we're looking at this compound up here. We see that there's three regions of electron density around this carbon. That means it's sp2 hybridized. So I can draw three of these sp2 hybrid orbitals, right? Two of them extending towards the 1s of hydrogens. And the third one extending towards the neighboring carbon over here. <coughs> this carbon, same scenario, three regions of electron density. 
sp2 hybrid orbitals extending out one towards the carbon this is the carbon here and then one towards the hydrogens that have one s orbitals these are sp2 hybrid orbitals that means there's left behind a p orbital that's not being bound not involved in this sp3 hybridization but we get an overlap here from the p orbital above and below okay so a double bond is an example of a sigma and a pi bond so what's the kind of bond between this carbon and this hydrogen is that a sigma bond or is that a pi bond well, if we look right here, we can see it's an S overlapping with a hybrid orbital. So that's an example of a sigma bond, right? Two hybrids overlapping, that's an example of a sigma bond. Two P orbitals overlapping that are like this, kind of up and up beside each other like that, that is a pi bond. If the two P orbitals were overlapping like that and the bulbous ends were interacting, that would still be called a sigma bond. But when they overlap, with the top and the bottom electron density right that is where we have uh, what we call a pi bond okay and in this compound where there's a carbon with a triple bond in a triple bond like this one around this carbon here i only have two regions of electron density one two so the hybridization here is what you know what the hybridization is around this carbon and in that carbon take your time and try to figure it out what would the hybridization be did you get it push pause if you didn't think about it longer okay i'll tell you now it's an sp hybrid because there's just one two regions of electron density that carbon took two of its atomic orbitals s and p put them in a hat and made sp hybrid orbitals that it can extend out. Now I'll draw it again down here. Here's one of the sp hybrid orbitals that it extends out towards this hydrogen. Here's another one of the sp hybrid orbitals that it extends out to this carbon over here. There's another sp hybrid orbital. Here's an sp hybrid orbital that's extended out towards this hydrogen over here. Okay. So what does that leave behind on these two carbons, right? That leaves behind not just one p orbital but now two of these p orbitals right and this this uh figure here draws a little bit better than me here are the two p orbitals that are left behind on the carbons and you get an extended amount of electron density being shared two of these pi bonds being formed so when you have this triple bond here one is a sigma overlap between sp hybrid orbitals and two of them are pi overlaps between two sets of p orbitals all right okay so here it is look at this compound count how many atom or how many sigma bonds there are in the compound and then wait oh for, first we got let's see is the intermolecule of c3 let's not worry about this one let's just do this one here count up how many sigma bonds are in this atom and how many pi bonds there are in this atom okay Take a second and figure that out. How many sigma bonds and how many pi bonds? All right. This will be the last slide for this chapter here. So as soon as you're done, you can, look, you can, you can go. All right. So let's count up the sigma bonds. Each single bond counts as a sigma bond. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And within a double bond, each one of his, one of those double bonds is a sigma bond so 9 10 so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 10 sigma bonds in this compound how many pi bonds 1 2 pi bonds in this compound 10 sigma 2 pi here count up the sigma and pi when you're done push pause go count them up and then let me know Okay, you ready? So, sigma bonds, stop me if you're not ready. Go ahead and count them up. Sigma bonds, we got 1, 2, 
this one has two pi's and one sigma. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and a total of 1, 2, 3, right, 2 here and 1 there, pi bonds. So 9 and three, 9 sigma 3 pi bonds. All right, that'll be a good place to stop for now.